Good evening, everyone. Good evening. And welcome back to my channel for another edition of Sunday YouTube Live Discussions. So this evening, we're going to talk about some terms that I hear and I see, you know, plastered all over social media all the time. And I don't think people understand the meaning of these terms and things. So I say, you know, I would dedicate this whole Sunday's uh, live to explaining exactly what these terms are. So um, things like hybrid, GMO, clones, uh, you know, heirlooms, and even like what a seed list, how that's made and things. I'm going to explain that this evening. So I'll just wait a few more, you know, seconds or so for everyone that's going to join to, you know, get logged in because I know there's a slight delay um, between the platform and the uh, social media outlets. Uh, this evening, I'm actually broadcasting on YouTube as I'm sorry, on Facebook as well. Um, so it's live on Facebook as I'm, you know, also on YouTube. I wanted to test this out to see how it would do. Um, so I thank you all for, you know, subscribing to my YouTube channel um, and, you know, coming in and watching my lives when I have them. Um, also, if you're on Facebook, you can also subscribe or you can follow my Facebook page. It's Urban Farm Sister on there as well. Um, <clears throat> and if you'd like to become a patron of uh, Urban Farm Sister, you can do so by visiting Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Urban Farm Sister. So I thank you all for uh, joining. Uh, good evening, Aaron. Uh, good evening, Owens Garden Frenzy. Hi, Mark. How are you doing? Thank you for uh, joining my live this evening. So I'm going to get started in just a second. And if you guys, like always, if you have any questions, you can put them in the comments and I'll answer them as I see them. And um, I'll also answer any questions that I may miss later on uh, via comments in the uh, video uh, once it's been uh, uploaded. You can ask questions now or you can ask them at the end. It doesn't matter to me. Okay, so a little bit about myself for those of you that do not know me. Make sure it's on the right window here. All right, a little bit about myself. I'm an entomologist, I'm a scientist, I'm a farmer, I'm a researcher, and an educator. Um, I have two degrees. I have a bachelor's degree from the Ohio State University in Agriculture. My focus was animal sciences and um, I minored in pre-veterinary medicine as well as entomology. I have a master's, which is a master's of science in entomology from the University of Nebraska. Um, so that makes me an entomologist. An entomologist is a person that studies insects. My focus was more on medical entomology. But I found that people do not understand any insects or their relatives, so I educate about them all. Um, I'm the owner of an urban farm here in Cincinnati called Kiwi Produce. Uh, on that urban farm, I actually turn an empty lot into an urban farm, and I, on there I have you know chickens and bees and things like that. So I'm an urban farmer. I also started a nonprofit called Agricademy Incorporated. Um, with Agricademy, I do research. I do agricultural research. Uh, in biotechnology, entomology, and also automation, but I also uh, do outreach, and I try to teach youth and adults that are socially disadvantaged about the agriculture industry beyond just farming. Um, most people think because of when you say the word agriculture, you just instantly talk about farming, but there's a lot of different options that are available under the agriculture industry, and that's what I do is I teach about those opportunities uh, as well as career options. I'm co-owner of Agricademy Labs, and there at Agricademy Labs, we offer services in biotechnology, um, entomology, and also automation. 
Um, like I said, I'm an urban farmer. I grow my plants on my urban farm, either in hydroponics, aquaponics, or in the soil. And like I said, I have bees and I have chickens. I have years of experience in floral culture. My family has owned a flower shop here called Blossom Floors for um, over 40 years. And then I have a background in veterinary medical research and uh, also public health. I've held many positions uh, since I graduated from undergrad uh, in veterinary medical research. I've worked at the Ohio Department of Agriculture, uh, University of Georgia, U Ohio State University, and uh, University of Cincinnati. I also used to be a disease investigator here for the health department um, for Hamilton County Public Health. So tonight we're going to talk about, um, you know, some genetic terms and things that people don't understand. So we're going to talk about what agricultural biotechnology is, what is genetics. Um, we're going to talk about some terms, how our genes passed on to the next generation. We're going to talk about what an allele is, mutations, types of inheritance, types of genetic crosses. And then we're going to talk about how we get our fruits and vegetables. Um, whether it be hybrids, heirloom, seedless, or GMOs, or genetically engineered is a new term that they're actually using now to um, describe that. So does anybody have any questions before I continue on? Okay. So, <clears throat> agricultural biotechnology, the wide concept of biotech or biotechnology encompasses a wide range of procedures for modifying living organisms according to human purposes. Um, this goes back to, to the domestication of animals, cultivation of plants, and the improvements to these through breeding programs that employ artificial selection as well as hybridization. hybridization. Uh, humans have used biotechnology since the dawn of civilization. We've been playing with genetics for a long time. So this is nothing new as far as, you know, us, you know, creating hybrids and um, the whole concept of GMOs is a new concept. But we've been playing with genetics for a long time, whether it be for plants, animals, uh, you know, to make these things uh cater to what we want them to. So when it came like domestication of dogs and, you know, different breeds, we played with genetics to create those breeds. We, we played with genetics to create, you know, those docile dogs that could come in our houses that wouldn't eat us. Um, and then when it came to the plants, you know, we created plants to, you know, cater to either our, our you know, our flavors, how certain tastes we wanted, or, you know, maybe the size and things like that. So we've been playing with genetics and we've been, you know, altering things for quite a while. So what is genetics? Well, genetics is a branch of biology con concerned with the study of genes, genetic variation, and heredity in organisms. So some terms that we need to go over as we talk about genetics, uh, the first one is DNA. Our DNA is short for deoxyribonucleic acid. Um, this is the hereditary, hereditary material in all organisms. Uh, chromosomes uh, is a DNA molecule with part or all of the genetic material of an organism. A gene is a unit of hereditary, I'm sorry, heredity which is transferred from a parent to offspring and is held to determine some characteristics of that offspring. Heredity, also called inheritance or biological inheritance, is the passing on, oops, is the passing on of physical or mental characteristics genetically from one generation to another. Anybody have any questions before I go on about that? So how are genes passed on to the next generation? Um, so there's two types of reproduction. There's asexual reproduction and there's sexual reproduction. Asexual reproduction produces offspring that are genetically identical to the parents. Uh, so this could be, in a sense, called like cloning. Um, sexual reproduction is which 
uh, when you combine genes from a female egg cell and a male sperm cell, uh, the combining of those creates a new organism, uh, which would be an offspring. So some more terms that we need to talk about are uh, alleles. Alleles are different forms of a gene. Genetic variations such as mutations are responsible for creating new alleles. So up in this picture at the top, we have um, we have a pair of chromosomes. And um, on the chromosomes, you see these little bands. So this is where you would actually have a gene that would show up. Uh, and these genes can be very, say this was a chromosome and you know something made it and the chromosomes paired up. And so one of these is from the father, one of these from the mother. Say the father had, you know, blue eyes and the mother had brown eyes. Um, that at that point on that chromosome, where that allele or that gene is, you would see some variation. And so when those two things came together, if one was dominant or one was recessive, one would dominate or the other. If you had two copies of the recessive and things like that, which we'll talk about all what all that means in a second, um, this gene would be expressed. So all genes have a usually have something that pairs up with it on another gene uh, at that same marker. Um, mutations. Uh, these are there's a change in the DNA sequence. So mutations can result from DNA copying mistakes made during cell division, also exposing uh, exposure to ionizing radiation, exposure to chemicals called mutagens, or infections uh, caused by viruses. So all these things can cause a gene to be mutated. Um, and I don't want to get too sciencey with this because even when it comes to making those genes, there's all these little things called codons. There's like A. Oh, I forget the letters A, G, C, and U. I believe is what they are. Um, uh, and they they pair up and they create these genes and they and create these codons and things. And this is how you know DNA is built. But there's things that can mutate those those um, those codons and it can cause that gene to express something differently. So sometimes mutations can be you know lethal. But also often sometimes you know, mutations can be expressed like, say, you know, if a person's albino, that's a mutation in a gene uh, on many chromosomes that are expressed. Um, so you have to you have to think of genetics as, you know, it's not just cut and dry. There's a lot of that goes on here um, that creates, you know, genes being expressed and things like that. Um, genetic hybridization is the process of interbreeding individuals from genetically distinct populations to produce a hybrid. A genetic hybrid would therefore carry two different alleles of that same gene. So on that little chromosome at the top here, a hybrid would be, you know, if if the mother and the father were both, you know, dominant for blue eyes, there was no way you would ever have a child that had brown eyes unless some mutation came along. But for the most part, if no mutation comes along, those children will always have blue eyes. Um, now, Say one parent has blue eyes, the other one has brown. Now you created a hybrid. You created a person that has two different alleles. Uh, they may be a carrier of the brown color, but they may express a different color. So, um, you know, genetic hybridization, it creates these hybrids that, you know, they just have two copies of that same, that same gene. All right, so hybrids. So a hybrid is produced when you cross two organisms that are the same phylogenetically phy phylogenetic family, but they would not normally mate with one another naturally. An example would be when you mate a female horse to a male donkey, you'll get a mule. Both animals are in the family Equidae, which is the family that includes horses, zebras, um, and I believe that's it. I forget the other, there's some other equine that fall under there. But under normal circumstances, they would never mate with one another. A mule would have what's called what is called or known as hybrid vigor, which means it out it will outperform both its parents. So when you cross this this female horse with this male donkey, and you create this mule, what happens is you create a, a you create an offspring that should exhibit the best characteristics of both parents. So you know when you see a mule. Um, you know, a lot of times they're kind of, they're larger, they're going to be larger than the donkey, 
they may not necessarily be bigger than the mother or, you know, the horse aspect of it, but they're going to be a lot bigger than the donkey. They're going to exhibit like, you know, different type of muscling. They're going to be a stronger animal because they're getting both the characteristics from the parents to create this better animal. Um, usually in the animal kingdom, when you cross uh, such organisms, you'll produce something that's sterile. But in the uh, plant kingdom, that isn't always the case. And so we're going to talk about that in a little bit, uh, how you produce, you know, hybrid plants. So homozygous versus heterozygous. So homozygous are purebred, which means homo means the same. So two genes in a pair are identical. Homozygous dominant, both genes in a pair are the dominant trait. So an example would be big A, big A. Say big A, big A stood for brown eyes. And then if you had um, <clears throat> a homozygous recessive, that person would have Little uh, little a, little a, so they would have, say, blue eyes. So if you took a parent, they had both, you know, you had the father, the, say the father was, you know, dominant for brown eyes. He had two big Bs and the mother had, you know, two, I'm sorry, two little A's and two, <laughs> the mother had two little A's and the father had two big A's and you would have brown, you know, brown eyes. All the children that were, you know, created in that union, they would have where they would both carry both of those alleles. So they would have a big A and a little A. And so they would be what is known as heterozygous, which means they would be a hybrid. Um, so in the picture up here, we have, um, it looks like purple. I think these were uh, pea flowers. So we had purple flowers. Purple is the dominant color and uh, white is the recessive color. So BB is uh, homozygous dominant and little b, little b is homozygous recessive. So if you made it this, these two plants together, you would get the plant in the middle, which is the, the big B, little b. So this would be a hybrid. So this, this plant, you know, genotypically would um, be BB, big B, little b, uh, but phenotypically it would exhibit the purple coloring. Um, now, if you mated that purple uh, hybrid plant with, say, you know, another plant that, you know, might even be recessive or dominant, then you would produce more um, organisms that, you know, may be able to, you know, remove that recessive gene out of there. Eventually, if you kept mating them over and over again with, you know, dominant plants, or if you mated it with recessive, you would get more and more recessive offspring. <clears throat> I hope that's clear. Hey, Taisha, how you doing? So there's different types of inheritance. Um, there's Mendelian, which is genetic traits are controlled by a single gene. So you had dominant or recessive. So we just talked about flower, flower color. Then we also have what is called sex link. So genetic traits that are controlled by the X or Y chromosomes. So there's certain genes um, that, you know, fall on a uh, particular, you know, chromosome. And if, you know, if, it, if it's an X-link chromosome, uh, X-link uh, inheritance gene, it'll only be expressed if that, if that organism has, you know, maybe two Xs or it might be, it might not be expressed if that person has one. Say if you're a male, you only have one X. Uh, but if you, if you, um, you know, reproduce with a woman and you produce a daughter, she'll have two copies of that same uh, she'll have XX and she may have two copies of that same gene. Um, so co-dominance is when both alleles contribute to the phenotype equally. So this is blood types. Examples that would be like blood types. Incomplete dominance is when the presence of both alleles leads to a blending of the traits. An example would be if you cross a red flower with a white flower, you'll get a pink flower. And polygenetic is when a trait is controlled by multiple uh, alleles. Um, so the best example of this would be with like a calico cat, like they express a whole bunch of different colors. Uh, if the calico cats, for the most part, they're mostly females, um, the calico coloring and things, uh, it's, it's, it's an X link, but it's also poly cause there's other genes that control that expression of those colors and things like that. <clears throat> so types of gene crosses, um, Monohybrid crosses are uh, 
When the parent organisms differ in a single characteristic, then there's dihybrid crosses in which uh, the parents differ in two different characteristics. So the characteristics are like they, they differ in two different genes or they differ in the monohybrid in one different gene. Uh, a back cross is when you uh, take uh, two lines and are crossed to yield a hybrid that exhibits a specific characteristic. And a test cross is performed on an organism with an unknown combination of genes. This organism is crossed with an organism who has a known genotype. So this actual, this other picture is supposed to go on the other page. Uh, uh, color blindness is an X-linked um, uh, trait, a gene that is, is expressed, and it, it, it falls on the X chromosome. Um, so if a person is colorblind, especially red, red, green colorblind, you know, they can't see red and they can't see green very well. It, 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 it um, you know, it expresses itself differently depending on who it is. Um, but it's usually linked to the X chromosome. So a male can be colorblind um, because, you know, they have the X chromosome. If the mother had, she was carrying that gene, her son would be, um, you know, colorblind. There's also females that are colorblind. Um, if they were able to somehow pick up two X chromosomes, one from the father and one from the mother, and they both exhibited that uh, color blindness, then yes, a female can be colorblind, but it, it's kind of hard, but it has happened. Um, but for these crosses, like I say, this is, um, this is how we determine certain characteristics when it comes to plants. Like say we were trying to get a, you know, when we're talking about the purple plant with the white plant and we only want purple plants, but you know, we only have, you know, plants there and we may not know exactly what, uh, their, their alleles are. So we can do what is called that test cross. So we can take one of those plants and cross them with say a recessive, recessive, um, um, purple plant, or it would actually be white and we could cross it with that plant. And what will happen is if, if that plant was not, um, you know, a hybrid and if it was pure, everything would come out purple. Now, if we start seeing plants express, you know, white and things like that, then we know that 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 particular plant was a, uh, you know, an hybrid. So this is how you, this is how we do plants. This is how they've done plants, you know, for thousands of years of us, you know, um, manipulating the genes and things. If we want them to express a certain color or a certain characteristic, we could use these types of, you know, crosses and things to get those plants to express that, uh, whatever trait we're looking for. Um, so Mark wants to know what external agents contribute to purpleness in plants like purple basil and purple cabbage. External agents, whether well, there, there's chemicals inside of there, uh, one of them is anthocyanins or flavonoids can contribute to that. They can give it that purple color. Um, uh, and genetics plays a role in that as well, as far as, you know, how much, how much anthocyanin is exhibited and things like that. So, um, if that's what you're asking, I'm not sure if that's what you're asking, but, uh, flavonoids, anthocyanins are some of those that can exhibit, uh, that purple coloring. All right, so here we have a, a cross of a purple flower with a white flower. Um, so here's some more terms that you guys need to know because this, this shows up when you see the word like that F1. The F1 generation refers to the first filial generation. So basically when we, when we mate this purple flower with this white flower, the F1 generation is that is the offspring that are produced from mating those two flowers together. So if the, the if the parent one parent was you know dominant for purple, and the the other one was dominant for white, when we crossed them and they came back all purple, we found out that the purple color is the dominating color and the white is the recessive color because it was not expressed. So that would be the F one generation. So if we let these plants, um, <clears throat> what happened is is these plants, the parents. When we cross them, they produce seeds, and these seeds produce the F1. So we plant those F1 seeds, 
And then we would do uh, what they all come back purple. And so what we do after that, is we, we could create the F2 generation. So the F2 generation is where you actually cross the F1s with each other. So you'll take two F1 plants and you cross them and you see what um, what is produced. So what you should have are, you know, you should have one plant that's uh, large P, large P would be purple. You should have two that are, um, you know, hybrids. So they would have big P, little P. And then you should have one plant that's uh, recessive and it would express that white because it would have the two little P's. Um, the, the initial generation is given the letter P for the parental generation. Um, so does anybody have any questions about this? This is usually called what you call a Punnett square. And I didn't really get into talking about uh, Mendelian inheritance and things. Um, Cause I, if you guys want to know more, I would suggest like you go and read genetics books and things. Um, I'm just trying to give you guys an explanation of how hybrids and things are created. Um, so when we're talking about the plants, you guys understand like, what am I talking about when I talk about a hybrid plant and things? So now we're going to talk about how um, we get our fruits and vegetables. So plant propagation is the process by which you grow a new plant. There are two types of propagation. There's sexual propagation for plants and there's asexual propagation or vegetative propagation. Um, so vegetative or accessual, there's three different types. There's grafting, there's cuttings, and there's also tissue culture. For asexual propagation, are you going? To, what you're going to do producing are seed. I mean, for sexual propagation, what you're producing are seeds. So Mark said, I was thinking of noble gases, but I have a family emergency and have to dip out right now. I will definitely check out the archive. Good job, sister. Okay, talk to you later. All right. So sexual propagation is the reproduction of plant by seeds. Uh, genetic material of the two parents is combined by pollination and fertilization to create offspring that are different from each parent. A fruit containing seeds, a fruit containing seeds is formed. Um, so there are several advantages of sexual propagation. Uh, it may be quicker or more economic than asexual propagation. So, I mean, if you have seeds, why not use them and grow your plants directly from seed? It may result in new cultivars and vigorous hybrids. So this is how you create hybrids was through sexual propagation. Um, for some plants, it may be the only means of propagation. Um, like things like lettuce, you really can't you really can't vegetatively um, uh, propagate lettuce. You have to pretty much go by seed, and and lettuce grows so fast. You know, it wouldn't be worth the effort to even try to uh, you know take cuttings and all the other stuff that you can do to make another plant, you know, the asexual way, uh, it might just be easier just to plant these seeds and grow them, and, you know, have a new lettuce plant in about 30 days. It provides a way to avoid transmission of particular diseases such as viruses. So if you're starting from seed, you know, most of the times the seeds will not have any viruses in them. Uh, usually when you're doing a, uh, asexual, um, reproduction methods, uh, you know, the plant could be diseased and you making those new plants from cuttings or, you know, tissue culture. You could actually be you just, you know, transferring a virus and things on to the to the clones. And so you will have, you know, all these plants that are infected. If you start from seed, there's no infection there. Um, it maintains genetic variation, which increases the potential for plants to adapt to environmental pressures. So here we have some. Um, a bee pollinating some flowers. So what happens is pollen is taken from the male and it's taken over to the female, uh, placed on the stigma, and then uh, the ovary will swell. And this is where the seeds will develop. And the ovary is actually the swollen fruit. And that's what we, you know, consume. Um, but in reality, that is where the seeds are developed is inside that fruit. So asexual vegetative reproduction involves taking parts of a plant, this can, this can include the stems, the root, or, and or leaves, and causing them to regenerate into a new plant or plants. The new plant is usually genetically identical to the parent plant. This is easier and faster than sexual uh, propagation for some species. Each plant cultivar going, 
uh, it maintains certain genes and characteristics. Um, large mature, uh, you get large mature plants a lot faster. So, you know, if you start from seed, you have to go through all the stages of, you know, vegetative growth, flowering, fruiting, and things like that. When you take a cutting, if you take a cutting from a plant that's already, you know, probably at the vegetative stage, about to enter the fruiting stage, you can actually get that cutting to grow a lot faster and, and get to that, again, to that, you know, flowering, fruiting stage versus if you took it to, from the seed all the way up. So a lot of times this is how people propagate trees and things, you know, trees that take a long time to grow. If you take cuttings, you can cut down on uh, the grow time. So say a tree takes about five, six years to start fruiting. If you take a cutting of it and it's already at year four, that cutting, it has that same genetic makeup as that mother plant that you took that sample from. And so it will actually start to fruit as well. Um, you know, a lot sooner than if you had grown it from seed. So how do we produce hybrids? Um, so sexual reproduction. Plant hybrids are made the same way um, as you would make the hybrids, you know, in the animal kingdom. Um, only thing with plants, this can happen naturally or it can happen artificially. So out in nature, you know, if you have pollinators and they're... Um, flying from flower to flower and say you have, you know, two squash type plants growing in close conjunction with each other, a bee could visit both of those and transfer pollen from, you know, the male of one, one plant and cross it with a female flower on another squash plant. And you can create a hybrid. You can create a cross of, you know, these two different squash plants. Um, now, artificially, you can do this as well by hand pollination. And so this is what, you know, scientists do as well as, you know, farmers, if they're trying to create a particular cultivar plant, they'll do what is called artificial uh, sexual reproduction where they actually hand pollinate. So it's not any pollinators. You're the pollinator. There's no insects involved. Um, this is usually in a controlled environment to make sure that the cross is exactly what you want it to be. So if you want, if you're using a particular male and you only want to pollinate a particular type of female, this is usually done in either like a greenhouse or a lab to prevent, you know, other uh, pollinators from coming in like bees and stuff and, you know, mixing up uh, pollen and, and things and, you know, pollinating flowers that may not need it to be pollinated. So the best example of a hybrid that, you know, is commonly consumed is the big boy tomato. Uh, the original parent of this was a pink bee steak variety. And then it was also a red variety tomato that the company that produced this particular tomato, they have kept that a secret. Um, but what they did is after they crossed those two plants, the pink beefsteak variety with the red variety, they collected seeds from that fruit um, that was produced. And those seeds were called the F1 hybrids or the Falau or Generation 1. And that first generation is what creates the better big boy. Now, if you let that better big boy tomato grow, it'll produce viable seeds. But what will happen is those seeds will not produce a better big, uh, the better big boy tomato because um, you would have to actually cross those plants with them, with each other to produce that particular plant again. Um, so what if you take those seeds from that 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 hybrid tomato? What will grow are plants that look like the original parent. So you'll have, you know, like a pink looking beefsteak tomato variety as well as a red variety grow. You won't actually have that beefsteak, uh, that better big boy uh, tomato grow. Um, so this is this is the only time where hybrids become a problem if you're trying to create, you know, um, a copy are you trying to create that same plant over without having to go and you know plant more seeds or create more crosses again and things like that so to overcome that you can do what is called the asexual reproduction is where you can actually clone that plant so cloning involves taking a cutting from a mother plant and rooting that cutting uh this process is called cloning uh the plant would be genetically identical to the mother plant uh, common plants that are, are produced this way are tomatoes, bananas, uh, marijuana, 
and other plants are commonly propagated this way. It cuts down on maturing time. So that, you know, that big boy tomato that we were just talking about, we could take that tomato and we could actually do asexual reproduction where we actually clone it. So we just take some cuttings of it, get those to root, and we can get a whole nother tomato plant to grow that exhibits those same characteristics of that uh, big boy tomato. So this, like I said, this is commonly done with a lot of plants. Um, it's, it's a lot quicker. You get to plant a lot to mature a lot faster. And it's not like, um, you know, waiting on the seed to germinate and then letting it veg vegetative growth and letting it flower and let it, you know, fruit. You can take cuttings and that plant will grow a lot faster and it'll get to that flower and fruiting stage, you know, a whole lot sooner than it would if you were just taking, you know, from seed. Does anybody have any questions? If you do, you can just put them in the comments. Okay, so what is an heirloom plant? So um, species are vegetables, flowers, and fruits grown from seeds that are passed down from generation to generation. Heirloom seeds are open pollinated, which means they rely on natural pollination from insects or the wind. Now, there are some plants that are wind pollinators. Uh, corn is one. Um, grass, other grasses are, are wind pollinators. Uh, things like cannabis plants, they're wind pollinators. Um, so these things are, you know, if they're an heirloom variety, they are open pollinated. They are allowed to naturally pollinate themselves. Uh, with an heirloom, though, there's no crossing of the pollen. The pollen, you know, so there's no creation of hybrids. Uh, so usually if you're trying to keep an heirloom variety, you're only going to grow that particular variety. You wouldn't grow two different types of tomatoes because you run the risk, especially if you're growing them outside of a, you know, a bee or some other insect coming in and taking pollen from one and taking it over to the other plant. So you keep those plants separate um, so that they do not, do not cross and create hybrids. Um, they're... There are some, you know, uh, farmers and things that they also develop a, uh, a date of what makes the plant an heirloom or not. So anything that was developed before 1951 can be categorized as an heirloom vegetable or fruit. Uh, if it was actually or not after 1951, it can't be considered an heirloom until it has 50 years of, you know, uh, being passed down um, and, you know, 50 years of history where the genes have not, you know, there's no variation. It's consistently the same plant over and over again. All right. So let's talk about seedless because I know people get up in an uproar, and especially when they talk about, you know, seedless grapes and seedless uh, watermelons and things like that. So a plant is considered seedless if it is able to produce a fruit without or contain a much reduced number of seeds, or in some cases only present uh, present traces of aborted seeds. So there's two types of seedless. Uh, there's the first one is fruit contains partially form form seeds that terminate after fertilization, and then the other one is called parthenocarpy. Uh, this is where a fruit is developed uh, is seedless because the ovary is still able to develop without fertilization. Therefore, they do not need to be pollinated. So um, watermelons, we'll talk about watermelons in a second. Uh, they are actually, uh, they need to be fertilized, but they are fertilized to make that fruit develop. Um, and, but the fertilization, which we'll talk about in a second, it won't produce any viable seeds. So seedless watermelons. Uh, seedless varieties are not truly seedless, but actually do contain tiny white edible immature seeds and less amounts than traditional watermelons. Uh, they were developed in the 1990s with the idea that some people don't enjoy spitting out the seeds of a watermelon. Seedless watermelons melons generally weigh between 10 to 20 pounds and have the same sweetness as the seeded varieties. So how do you make it? How do you make a seedless watermelon? Well, first you need to create what is called a tetraploid plant. Tetraploid plants are produced by treating the terminal buds of a diploid plant with co 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 Um, 
which causes the chromosome number of the meristematic cells inside to double. So normally a watermelon would have 22 chromosomes, but when you treat it with this uh, culture scene, what happens is it creates a uh, watermelon that has 44 chromosomes instead of 22. So when I talk about the Mary stem in this picture here at the top, where you see that arrow, it says a terminal bud. This is where you would drop that chemical colchicine on there. And that would produce a branch that would um, make um, the cells there and the chromosomes and all that uh, pre present 44 chromosomes instead of 22. Uh, that colchicine actually comes from a plant called crocus, autumn crocus. Um, so it's a natural plant derived chemical that is used to create this, um, this uh, what do you call it, a tetraploid plant. So after you create that tetraploid plant, what you're going to do is you're going to cross that tetraploid seed uh, parent bearing, uh, I'm sorry, crossing a tetraploid 4N seed parent bearing 2N eggs with a diplo diploid 2N pollen parent uh, bearing haploid end sperm. So what happens is you're going to take, uh, since it has two copies of, it has double the copies of the chromosomes, you're going to, instead of it being 22, it now has 44. So let's be considered a 4N. Normally be considered a 2N. So what you're doing is you're taking that 4N plant and uh, during a process called meiosis, it splits, those, those chromosomes split. So you have, you'll have one copy of the 2N and then on the father, you'll have one copy um, of the uh, sperm, and this sperm will um, join with this 2N, and what this will do, it will result in a what is called a 3N zygote. Um, and this is a diploid embryo. I know it gets kind of confusing, but this is how this is done. Um, and so the embryo has uh, three copies of the, the gene in its chromosomes now. So it has three in. So you plant this seed and it will yield a three in watermelon bearing three in seedless watermelons. So then you take that triploid female parent and you pollinate it with a diploid male. So you pollinate it with a normal male. This three in female is pollinated with a male. That, that pollinization, it does not actually fertilize the eggs, but it triggers the flowers to actually make a fruit and so this is how we get the fruit uh i'm sorry the seedless watermelon so it will not fertilize those seeds that are in there so they'll never be viable viable or you know they'll never be able to uh mature and you'll never be able to plant those seeds but that whole act of pollinization will cause the triggering of those flowers to make a fruit so it'll swell and it'll actually make that watermelon but then it'll be seedless uh, so it it follows the same development as, you know, like any other watermelon. But when you actually cut it open, it'll be seedless or it'll have those little white seeds in there. So this is how it's made. Um, so, you know, when I say we've been manipulating genes and things and we found ways to do that, we've been doing this for a long time. Um, so there isn't it isn't in a sense as a, a GMO, as we're going to talk about in a second, like a genetically modified, genetically engineered, where we've taken, you know, like genes and we spliced them from other, you know, other creatures into other things. It's not like that. It's just using a chemical to manipulate, mutate genes. This is what happened when I, you know, I was talking about those terms that cochicine co uh, chemical actually mutated the, 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 um, the chromosomes. Um, and what it did is mutated those chromosomes to the point to where, you know, they doubled in numbers. And then when you cross those, when you cross those over, um, it's not going to produce any viable seeds, but it, it will trigger that, you know, whole process of that fruit being developed. <clears throat> so Taisha said, this is so important because many of us do not trust seedless fruits. Uh, your journey said, sounds like the watermelon is retarded. Um, so yeah, no, not in a sense because, you know, a watermelon is just a fruit. It doesn't have any, you know, mental capacity. It doesn't think it's just a swollen ovary that's holding seeds. So you have to think of it that way. It's just a swollen ovary that's holding seeds and it needs to have those seeds, you know, 
they need to have something to consume them to expose those seeds so they can actually be germinated and passed on and you know grow and pass on that genetic information. Um, so it would not be like a you know, uh, you know, like in a human or an animal when you cross and you create like you know, um, <clears throat> you know, people with Down syndrome and things like that. It's not the same thing because a fruit does not have a mental capacity. All right. So any questions about that? I know that was kind of loaded, um, but that's how it's done. It's a lot of crossing, a lot of you know. Initially, using chemicals to manipulate chromosomes, then you have to cross um, a plant with another plant. Then you take that plant and you cross it with another, and then you you pollinate, and then you finally get what you want. So it's not like, it's not like a simple task. It takes it's a process. Um, so a lot of times, the farmers that you know grow these seedless watermelons, they will have you know a, a breeding stock of those uh, three three in uh, watermelons already available so they don't have to go through that whole process of um, creating it or they'll have a seed stock. They'll have, you know, lots and lots of seeds of those three ends so they can just mate them with those um, those males. So what how do they how they do it out in the field is they'll plant those females that are three in and they'll plant some males near nearby that are two in and, you know, bees and things will come in and they'll pick up the pollen from those males and they'll take it to those three ends, and that's how the pollination occurs. So they don't have to they don't have to physically go out and hand pollinate. They'll use bees and things to pollinate those plants. <clears throat> All right. So now we're going to talk about GMOs because this this is this is the big one. Um, this is what every when I when I when I was talking about the other things, the hybrids and stuff, people kind of confuse GMOs with those things. Um, but genetically modified organisms also called genetically engineered is a new term that they're using. I think they're trying to stray away from the GMO and kind of create confusion, um, but they're all the same thing. Um, they differ greatly from a hybrid. GMOs are engineered in a laboratory. They are created by taking alleles or those genes, you know, those terms we talked about, alleles, genes, from one organism and putting it into another organism by splicing those genes. The parent organisms are not phylogenetically similar. So that means they are not in the same family. You know, when we talked about the, the, the donkey and the horse, they're all in the same family equidae. But when we make GMOs, we take things that, you know, maybe in two different kingdoms, we, we take bacteria from the bacteria kingdom and we put it into a plant, which is in the plant kingdom. Or we take, you know, you know, they have, they're doing some GMO creation in fish and other animals around now. And so they're taking genes from totally different creatures and putting it into other creatures. Um, but the best example of uh, a GMO is the creation of BT corn. Um, so we'll talk about that and how that's made. All right, so Bacillus thuringiensis Bt is a bacteria that makes toxins that affect certain insects. So these could be uh, there's BT for caterpillars or D BT for mosquitoes. There's also BT for beetles. Uh, scientists have been able to find the genes that create this toxin in the bacteria. Uh, BT toxin genes are placed into corn plant cells in the lab. So what they do is they take the gene out of the bacteria, they splice it out, they cut it out, they take that gene and they take corn cells and they they fuse that DNA from that BT gene into uh, corn plant cells. The cells are allowed to go in a, grow in a petri dish. If they survive, these cells are allowed to then grow out into plants. So this newly developed plant now has DNA that produces the BT toxin in it, so it can be protected against caterpillar attacks. Um, so BT was created. BT corn was created this because. Um, the corn industry was being ravaged by um, corn earworm, European corn borer, and a whole bunch of other caterpillars that would actually, you know, feed on the ear of corn that was developing to the point it would cause so much damage, you know, that they couldn't sell the product or it would reduce their yield. So, you know, they would try to spray pesticides, but a lot of these caterpillars actually go down and they're protected by that outer uh, husk. So the, the pesticides would never get into into the actual corn husk where the caterpillars were. So they were just able to feed, and, you know, eventually 
pupate and then, you know, fall off and um, pupate and then create another moth or or whatever the, the caterpillar was going to turn into. Um, so they came up with this BT corn. So when the caterpillars started feeding, what would happen is, is say you were spraying BT because you can use BT by itself on your plants. Now you can buy BT, you can mix it up. This is what I always recommend when people say they have problems with caterpillars, especially like on their collard greens and stuff. I said, just go buy some BT, mix it up and spray it on there. And what happens is the caterpillars will eat that bacteria and it'll give them a bacterial infection and the toxins in there will actually kill them. But now they create this corn that actually expresses that same gene that the bacteria would express. The corn expresses that gene now because they were able to splice that gene into that corn. Um, and so when the caterpillars start feeding on the corn, they feed on the corn and they eat that toxins. They eat those toxins that are being expressed by the genes inside that corn and they will die. So they won't be able to, you know, in theory, they won't be able to eat the corn. What they're finding out now, though, is that you know, insects, they, they uh, are able to mutate their genes to, you know, make sure they are able to survive in the environment. So some of these caterpillars, you know, now they're resistant to this BT corn. So now they're trying to come up with another type of, you know, GMO that will, uh, that will actually, um, inf you know, be effective against the caterpillars. So your journey said, so now we eat these toxins. So BT, BT toxin is not toxic to humans. It's not toxic to animals. Uh, unless you're a caterpillar or a mosquito or a, um, beetle, uh, BT actually lives naturally in the soil. So you're always in contact with it anyway, but it's not toxic to humans. Um, it is only toxic to these caterpillars. Um, so that was that was why BT corn was created. It was to, you know, allow farmers to grow their corn um, without having to, you know, have a loss due to caterpillar damage. <clears throat> so these are the only GMO grown crops here in the United States. Uh, seeds are only sold to commercial farmers. So when people be telling me, you know, like I always get this question. Where can I go get non-GMO seeds from? And I always tell them, you can go to the, the you know, the, the regular store and buy those seeds. Um, GMO seeds are not going to be sold to, you know, the everyday consumer. The reason being, uh, places like Monsanto that creates these GMO uh, crops, they only they only sell to commercial farmers so that they can actually track those seeds. Um, they do not want those farmers at the end of the season, you know, harvesting those seeds and trying to, you know, save the seeds and use them the following year. Um, what they'll do is they'll come in and they'll confiscate all of those. They want them to constantly keep buying seeds every year from them. So they will not allow them to use the GMO seeds over and over again. Um, but like I said, there's only 10 crops in the United States that are uh, GMO. So I don't know how well this picture shows up on your screen, but there's corn. Hold on, let me get the bigger screen here. So there's 33 types of GMO corn that are, you know, out that that uh, commercial farmers use. And this is sweet corn as well as field corn. Um, and I'll actually be having a class for the children as well as the adults coming up on Tuesday where we're going to talk about corn. So if you want to join that, you can. Um, but there's six types of potatoes that are GMO. There's 20 types of soybeans that are GMO, GMO. There's only one type of canola that's GMO. Sugar beets, there's only one type of um, uh, plant that's GMO. There's one type of apple. Um, there's two types of papayas that are GMO. Um, alfalfa, there's two types of plant. And there's two types of squash plants that are GMO. Um, but I, like I said, again, you're not going to find these at the, the, the store. These are going to be um, <clears throat> sold to commercial farmers. So you're good if you go to the store and you buy seeds or, you know, things like that. Now, if you start buying things offline and, you know, maybe some of these farmers are selling their GMO crops, then you may be introduced to, uh, you know, buying GMO uh, things. But they should be telling you that that product is GMO. They shouldn't be, you know, secondary hand you know, secondhand selling 
these seeds, but sometimes they do. Um, especially like on sites like on eBay and stuff. I've seen uh, people trying to sell their GMO seeds, and I don't know what the reasoning is. Um, maybe they just needed money, so they would try to sell them. Um, but these are the only 10 crops. So um, if you go to the grocery store, um, these are the ones that are going to be GMO. Now, when we talked about hybrids, there's a lot of things that you go to the store that are hybrids. Um, you know, there's there's bananas, there's apples, there's all that. There's nothing wrong with eating those hybrids. Like, that's just how they were made. They were created, you know, for different reasons. Some of them grow a lot faster. Some of them have a better taste and things. Um, there's nothing wrong with hybrids. I'm not going to say there's, I'm not going to say GMOs are safe, but I'm not going to say they're not safe either. There's not enough research for them. A lot of these came about in the 90s. Um, so they haven't even been out that long. Uh, they came out in the 1990s. Um, some of them were just created within, like, the potatoes. They were just created within 2015. Um, so these, a lot of these are new. So I can't say there's a lot of data that proves that they're, they're not causing any health problems or anything like that. But when it comes to hybrids, like I say, that can occur naturally or it can, be, can occur artificially by hand pollination. Um, but at the end, you're still just using, if you're, you're creating a hybrid tomato, you're still just using two tomato plants. When it comes to GMOs, you're using DNA from totally different organisms and you're putting it into another organism, you know, that will never express that gene in the first place. Um, you know, corn would have never expressed a BT gene. Uh, they had to take that gene from that bacteria and put it into there. So just knowing that, um, I can't, I'm not going to tell you one is better than the other as far as GMOs um, or, you know, I don't, there's not enough data. So they're still doing research. They're still trying to do, you know, comparison studies and things like that. They're trying to make sure that it's not environmentally uh, damaging. There's still a lot of information that has to be done uh, to, to verify the, you know, if these are safe or not. So that's where it comes in that, you know, we need more people in the field of agriculture especially when it comes to biotechnology, you know, so they can go in and test these things and say, you know, we've done these sterile tests and we found that, you know, indeed GMOs are not bad or we did find that they are bad and this is why. Um, but, you know, there's not a lot of people entering, entering, that, entering into that field. Um, so we need people to enter in that field, especially people of color, so that we know exactly what we're eating and uh, what we're getting and how these things are created. Because, I mean, if, you know, if I hadn't explained some of this, some people would have never known how some of these things were done or how this, how they were created and things like that. So we need more people in this field um, studying, researching, um, getting out the information as well as producing. Maybe, you know, maybe there's a hybrid that they could have produced had somebody been working on it that could have been resistant to caterpillars had they, you know, did the crossing and things and they wouldn't have to go to resort of uh, creating GMOs. All right. So that's the end of the presentation. Anybody have any questions? Taisha said, let's see, I'll put it up on the screen. She said, I saw the Monsanto brand throughout the countryside in Ahoy. Ahoy. <laughs> I know it's in Hawaii. I am not how you say it though. Uh, where coffee farms are, those plantations and other places were. Oh, yeah. Um, Monsanto is all down there. But you, also, you know, also remember Monsanto creates things like Roundup and they create pesticides, um, uh, herbicides and all types of things. So, um, yeah, Monsanto, they dominate uh, in those areas. Now, there is not any um, uh, GMO coffee. Um, but so they're probably there, you know, studying some of their pesticides on those plants. Uh, Dole Plantation, Dole, they do the bananas and things. So, um, yeah, they were probably down there trying to trying to develop another banana because in a minute I'm going to tell you guys, you guys have some homework if you want to do it. Um, but I'll get to that in a second. But I want to talk about Kiwi Produce School, the website. Uh, I'll have information from this presentation up on that website. So if you want to go there, you can. Um, I also have old webinars. I have as well as classes. Um, I have classes on there. 
uh, that you can purchase as well as some free classes and things like that. So please visit the website, kiwiproduce.com forward slash, I'm sorry, kiwiproduce.farm forward slash school. <clears throat> and so I have a research assignment for you guys if you choose to do it. Um, I have two questions that are going to follow after this, but if you, I need for you guys to pick one of the following questions and send the answer to me at urbanfarmsister at gmail.com. The uh, people that submit the best uh, two papers um, will get to read their responses on my live next Sunday. Um, so here are the questions, and it's due this coming Thursday if you do this to do the, the project. So the first uh, research topic is. Research and write a short paper explaining the creation of the Cavendish banana. Also tell me the fungus that threatens to wipe this crop out. Explain how the propagation method used to keep this plant going has contributed to its destruction. So if you choose to do that, um, you know, like I say, uh, answer the question and then send me an email, urbanfarmsister at gmail.com. The second question is, uh, People often say something is man-made and does not exist in nature, and so they deem it as bad. One crop that is all that always gets put under the radar are carrots. Research and explain to me the history of carrots. What family of plants do carrots belong to, and what is the function of a carrot as it pertains to the plant's biology? What are some other colors of carrots? And after researching, tell me if you think the creation of an orange carrot is a bad, are a good thing and why and also explain how orange carrots are created so if you can if you want to answer that question you don't want to deal with the banana one you can answer this one um again send the answer to urban farm sister at gmail.com and let's see i think that's it so any other questions comments concerns anything um Again, if you have any questions or anything, you can always put them in the comments. Um, <laughs> Richard, you crazy. <laughs> yeah. um, or you can contact me at my email, gmail.com, or you can contact me on the uh, school website, which is kiwiproduce.farm forward slash school. You can find me on social media. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, as well as Instagram under urban farm sister um but yeah so i hope you guys learned something this evening i hope you find out what a hybrid is um it's not as bad as people try to make them out to be uh, i think a lot of times they're confusing them with gmos which i can't say are bad or they're not good either um you know that's still up in the air so i'm not gonna you know debate that with anybody <clears throat> um but you know, this is how these things are created. And these are, this, this is how we get our food. So most of our food that we get from the grocery store has undergone um, either hybridization where they cross plants or they're GMO plants. Um, you rarely get heirlooms at the, at the grocery store. Usually people grow their own heirlooms. And the reason that heirlooms, because Aaron's asking the question, why do heirloom seem, seeds cost more? Um, well, they're, the reason they cost more is because they're pure bred for the most part. There's no, there's no crossing. Um, so you plant that seed this year, you, and if you don't grow another plant that's similar to that and they don't cross, you can, you can collect those seeds from that plant and you can grow another plant that's very similar to that one the following year. Now there's going to be a little bit of very uh, genetic variation because you know environmental uh, impact can uh, you know kind of alter genes and that's how things adapt to certain areas uh, is by um, you know you know growing and then it passes on genetic information to those offspring and then the following year if you grow those seeds those offspring will exhibit you know what was what was passed on to them from their parents the year before um, so they're purebred. And, you know, they are not hybrids. So, you know, you're going to constantly get the same plants over and over again. A lot of times, too, like I told you, these heirlooms are very old. Um, they were passed down 
you know, some of the, some of these plants came from, you know, slavery time or, you know, um, be even before that, uh, they came from other regions and they were brought over here. And so if you still have that orig original genetics and things, um, it was going to cost you more because that plant is, you know, purebred and it's been passed down for, you know, 50 years or more. So, like I said, I hope this helps our hybrid plant stronger. So, yes, they can be. That's usually why you create a hybrid. You try to create a hybrid plant to exhibit um, characteristics of its original parents by combining two different parents. You're trying to you're trying to get the best characteristics of that parent. So. If one parent is resistant to, say, a viral disease or a bacterial disease, and then, but the other parent, it may not be resistant to that disease, but it's a tall plant that produces a lot of fruit. Well, I want that. I want that characteristic from that plant that's not resistant. I want that tall plant with that you know exhibits a lot of fruit, but I also want that bacterial or that viral resistance. So I would cross those two. And we would get both qualities. We get a, a hybrid that is resistant to plants, but it also is tall and it produces that fruit that I want. Um, so that's why you produce hybrids a lot of times um, to exhibit characteristics that you are looking for. It might be a certain color. It might be a certain, you know, like I said, it might produce a lot of fruit or it might grow tall or it might whatever characteristic you're looking for. You produce that hybrid to create that characteristic. Um, <clears throat> so that's why we call it hybrid vigor. Uh, hybrid vigor is that that hybrid is going to outperform its parents. All right, we got another. How do you pollinate plants in the hydroponics garden? So you're going to have to hand pollinate if it's indoors and you do not have access to, oops, I didn't want to turn that banner on. You don't have access to um, pollinators. No, if you, so if you set your hydroponics outside, uh, you will have access to pollinators. Um, but if you're indoors, you're going to have to hand pollinate. So you're going to have to know what female flowers look like. Uh, you're going to have to know which flowers, like say if you're, have a tomato or a pepper, the male and female parts are what's in that same flower versus if you're growing a squash plant, you have a female flower and you have a male flower. So you're going to have to know the plant's anatomy and know how, how you go about poll hand pollinating these different types of plants. Um, you have to know what a female flower looks like on a squash plant versus a male flower and things like that. Um, but you're going to have to be the pollinator in that instance. You're going to have to take pollen from the male and put it onto the female uh, reproductive parts so that she gets pollinated. And uh, a lot of times, you know, certain like squash plants, they only open up for a certain amount of time during the day. Um, so like if they're outside, it's usually dawn to up to about 11 o'clock is when those flowers are open and then they close. Um, but if you're growing in hydroponics, it's going to, it's going to mimic whatever your lighting schedule is once it gets to that flowering stage. So you're going to have to know, uh, you got to pay attention of when your light comes on and when those flowers open up when they close. So you're going to have to make your lighting schedule correspond to when you'll be there so you can actually hand pollinate. So are there any other questions? All right. Well, thank you guys uh, for watching my live this evening. Uh, please make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel if you have not already. Um, also, if you're on Facebook, make sure you follow my Facebook page, uh, facebook.com forward slash urban farm sister. Also, if you'd like to become a patron, I have a Patreon account as well. Uh, it's www.patreon.com forward slash urban farm sister. Um, you can support me so that I can keep this content coming. 
Um, it's a lot of work that goes into making these presentations every week. It's a lot of work goes into, you know, all the posts that I do and all the, you know, research that I do to uh, find the, um, you know, the topics and things. Um, so if you'd like to become a patron, that would help me out a lot. And I appreciate it very much. Um, if there's no other questions, like I say, if you have any later on, you can always send me an email or find me on social media and send me a direct message. Um, thank you guys and have a good evening. Bye.